To better understand our world, ourselves, and our future, this program is made possible by the people of Chevron. Chevron, giving thought to television. Roused from their marathon sleep, giants come to life and head down the mountains. Driven by hunger, they travel time-worn trails to the valleys below. It is the time of the Kodiak bear, the largest carnivore that walks the earth. Kodiak Island lies under the spell of a warm ocean current. Near the icy edge of the Arctic, it shimmers like a green oasis. In this vast garden, bears grow fat on some of the richest salmon streams in the world. share this bounty with island residents. Each year, the fishing season gives cause for celebration and prayer. Kodiak's native people have seen centuries of cultural mixing. One young man seeks to unravel the saga of his ancestors. Like this? Practicing their timeless ways, this family draws sustenance from the land. But paradise is up for sale. As outsiders stake their claims, the bears are losing ground. For millennia, Kodiak was safe haven to both native and bear. Now the survival of one could bring the downfall of the other. More than ever, their destinies are linked on the island of the giant bears. Rising from the North Pacific Ocean is an island with 900 miles of rocky coastline. Here the last ice age carved deep valleys and mountains 4,000 feet high. 600 miles south of the Arctic Circle, Alaska's Kodiak Island is larger than the state of Delaware. Its climate is temperate and wet. Clouds blanket the skies more than half the year. Kodiak's rugged terrain is the perfect habitat for nearly 3,000 of the world's largest bears. In late fall, when food becomes scarce, Kodiak bears head for the mountains to dig their dens.
During winter sleep, adult bears do not eat, drink, or eliminate bodily waste for up to six months. All pregnant females give birth in late January or early February. Weighing only one pound when they are born, the cubs develop quickly. In late March, bears begin to leave their dens in predictable order. Adult males emerge first, then lone females and those with older cubs. Females with newborn appear last, sometimes as late as June. Ever cautious, a female with new cubs may linger near the protection of her den for several weeks. Their greatest foe is their own kind. Adult males commonly attack and eat cubs. On the way down from his denning site, a young male blunders into the female's range. She will fight to the death if need be. The male gives her a wide berth. Placing their paws in the tracks of their forebears, the giants tread centuries-old trails to feeding grounds below. By late June, the island is awash with new life and blanketed in green. Some 400 pairs of bald eagles flourish here. They compete for small prey like mice with the nimble red fox. After nearly six months of fasting, some bears can't reach this Garden of Eden quickly enough. With all its lush finery, Kodiak has laid out a feast for them. Hundreds of wildflowers burst into bloom with succulent roots, stems, and leaves. The bloodthirsty beast of legend actually consumes over half its yearly diet in berries and grasses. In late spring, bears spend many waking hours grazing, like colossal furry cattle. On their yearly migrations, whales pass through Kodiak's waters. Occasionally, a carcass floats up an inlet and provides a gamey treat that may attract dozens of hungry bears. Bears eat meat whenever they can. Confirmed scavengers, they appear to relish rotten flesh as much as a fresh kill. Such a lavish whale banquet is a choice prize in the weeks before the salmon run. Most bears abandon themselves to the feast. But a mother with cubs remains ever on the defensive. Bear experts are at a loss to explain the animal's peculiar habit of rolling and carrion. Some suggest a state of euphoria brought on by a full stomach. Others say the bear just can't get enough of the smell.
A bear's nose is its window on the world. Through smell, a bear locates food, selects mates, and avoids enemies. Vision and hearing are thought to be as good as or better than a human's. When half a ton of bear reaches speeds of 35 miles an hour, very little can escape it or keep up. Flat-footed and pigeon-toed, Kodiak bears are surprisingly agile. An adult male may weigh up to 1,500 pounds. He can kill a deer with a single blow to the neck from his massive paw. A large female may reach half his size. The Kodiak bear is considered a subspecies of the brown bears or grizzlies of North America. Towering up to 10 feet tall, he fears no predator except one. Early in this century, tales of the giant bear reached the ends of the earth. Trophy hunters once enjoyed open season here. The three largest bears ever shot were Kodiaks. Others came to collect the valuable hides. One hunter boasted of 70 bears taken in a single year. Slain females left orphaned cubs doomed to die in the wild. In 1925, hunting regulations set limits on trophy kills. The sale of hides was outlawed. But Kodiak's ranchers blamed cattle losses on the bears and went on shooting. Conservationists feared the Kodiak bear could become nothing more than a museum specimen. Their concern reached Washington. In 1941, President Franklin D. Roosevelt established the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge, nearly two million acres of prime bear habitat. Sharing this land with the bears are Kodiak's native people. Ancient ties link Sven Hawkinson Jr. to this wilderness. The Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge is the home of the Kodiak bear, but it's also my home. My village is located right in the midst of this bear refuge. My people have been here for over 7,000 years. We've developed a relationship of mutual respect for each other, the bear and humans and also the attitude that we avoid each other when we do run into each other. They're just part of living in a wildlife refuge. Three of Kodiak's native villages are surrounded by refuge lands. On the southeast coast, Old Harbor stands on traditional fishing and hunting grounds. Accessible only by boat or plane, the village is home to some 300 residents. Five miles of gravel road link the village airstrip, post office, and public school. Fishing is the main economy and the only livelihood most young people can look forward to. Sven Hawkinson Jr. first went fishing when he was six and learned the ways of the sea from his father. A retired fisherman, Sven Hawkinson Sr. was born of a native mother and Danish father. He served as village mayor for 27 years. His son will follow a different path. Sven Jr. hopes to preserve the vanishing culture of his people, the Alutic. On a scholarship, he is pursuing a PhD in anthropology at Harvard University. 
The Aleutic language was once banned in public schools. George Inger recalls being punished for speaking his mother tongue. He is one of the few village elders who remains fluent. So there's a lot of difference between Port yeah. Graham and here, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. The decline of Aleutic culture is a symptom of troubled times for Kodiak's native people. Recent history robbed them of their dominion on the island. Today their lands are pledged not for their prosperity, but for the protection of the Kodiak bear. In early summer, females bring their new cubs down from the mountains. Cubs learn by example. They imitate their mother's every move. Now that means braving the new medium of water for the first time. Two to three years, mother and cubs form an inseparable family unit. Then comes the time when cubs have learned all they can from their mother. She is less attentive with every passing day. Survival of the species demands that she produce another litter. Soon she will tolerate her cubs no more. The breakup of a family can be brutal. This two-year-old hardly comprehends why his mother suddenly turns on him. Her aggression is no bluff. Confused and frightened, the cub is abruptly abandoned. After they are weaned, siblings may remain together for a few months. Some become solitary creatures. This is a precarious time in a young bear's life. All survival skills will be put to the test. Less than half of all cubs survive to adulthood. Aggressive males prey on young bears. Competition and starvation take their toll. <coughs> Mating season takes place between May and July. But a pregnant female's fertilized eggs will not implant in her uterus until early winter. In this way, all cubs are born around the same time. Kodiak bears begin to mate at four to five years. Occasionally, they form small mating groups. These two young males vie for the attentions of a female partner. Rebuffed, the males put on a show of mock battle, still excited by the presence of a female in heat. Most commonly, courtship involves couples. Two compatible bears may spend up to a week together and mate repeatedly. Little can distract them. But a larger, potentially threatening male can intimidate even the most ardent suitor. He retreats to the relative safety of solitude.
For most of the year, bears tend to avoid each other. Encounters can lead to mortal combat. Mating season marks a truce between the sexes. Only briefly in early summer do they seek out each other's company and enjoy a honeymoon of sorts. On Sundays, the people of Old Harbor are called to worship at Three Saints Orthodox Church. Russian colonists brought their religion here over 200 years ago. The faithful at Old Harbor belong to the oldest Russian Orthodox community in the Western Hemisphere. These people share a cultural tapestry of many strands, American, Scandinavian, Russian. Woven throughout are the traditions of their Aleutic ancestors, the first to claim the island as their own. More than 7,000 years ago, a seafaring people settled Kodiak. Along its fertile shores, they would flourish. Fond of ornament, men pierced their lips and noses with ivory jewelry. Women tattooed and painted their faces. They excelled at needlework and fashioned clothing from animal and bird skins. Skilled marksmen pursued even the Kodiak bear with their weapons of stone, wood, and bone. They hunted sea otter, seal, and whale. They harvested the yearly salmon runs. The Aleutic lived by the seasons. In summer, they stocked their larders. Like the bears, they retired for the winter. Families shared large houses built of driftwood and sod. Dousing fire-heated rocks, they practiced the cleansing custom of the steam bath. The luxurious fur of the Kodiak bear was their bedding. They left no written language, no cities, no lofty monuments. Only fragments of their vibrant culture remain. At Kodiak's Alutic Culture Center, Sven Hawkinson Jr. sorts through pieces of his past. Archaeological sites have yielded thousands of artifacts. They hint at long-lost myths of hunters and heroes. A carving of a bear suggests the Aleutic may have revered the giants with whom they shared the island. Hawkinson hopes to write a history of his people. Clues to a tragic chapter are etched on this stone. Strangers arrived in ships and brought the reign of the Aleutic to a sudden and violent end. Russian fur traders first began to penetrate Alaska in the 1700s. Their decisive encounter with the Aleutic of Kodiak took place at this outcrop called Refuge Rock. Russian accounts of the event had long been known, but the site was not discovered until 1990. Sven Hawkinson, Jr. was a member of the archaeological team that began excavations here. Today, Hawkinson leads a field trip. There, and over here and then down the hill. And then we excavated the full barabra over here. Wow. The outlines of a sod house, or barabara, stand out clearly. Off the communal area are a number of side rooms. Some human bodies back over here in this corner. Um, we figured that was it main or chief's bedroom over there because it's so big but these would be side rooms for each family and food figure. storage though wouldn't you have to have um, a side room for food storage food? pits here 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 and here the remote site was not a permanent settlement but a sanctuary people took refuge here only when threatened by enemies and probably during times of war you probably had an extra people staying in here too we figured there was probably at least 2,000 people when Shalikov came and attacked. Most of them were women and children. 
In August of 1784, a Russian fur trader, Gregory Shelikov, arrived on Kodiak, demanding hostages and sea otter pelts. To defy him, the Alutic retreated to Refuge Rock. High in their fortress, the people felt safe. They were betrayed by one of their own. He led the Russians through a secret inlet to the back of Refuge Rock. There, they watched the low tide reveal a hidden land bridge. On August 13th, at dawn, people awoke to a terrifying thunder. During the night, Shelikov's men had set up cannons on the land bridge. From this vantage point, the entire summit of the rock was exposed. When the Russians stormed the rock, panic erupted. Most natives had never seen firearms. The invaders appeared as demons. Women clutched their children as they threw themselves from the cliffs. Many hundreds were killed or executed. 500 more were taken hostage. Not a Russian was lost. For the next two centuries, only ghosts would walk these cliffs. The name of this place is called a Wallach, and most of the people don't remember what it means. And it's just someplace bad. It's basically people had made themselves forget about it because when all these people had died, the bodies had washed ashore, and it was really stink for a couple of years, and nobody would come back here. And they just kind of left it. Hey guys, look at this. It's arrow point. For Sven Hawkinson Jr., Refuge Rock has become more than an exercise in archaeology. To touch an arrow point crafted by a long dead ancestor stirs feelings that once caught him by surprise. Uh, when I first came out here, it was kind of like ho hum, you know, I didn't realize how powerful it was until last year when I first. When we first started excavating, it really hit me. I wasn't able to sleep when I first got here. Um, realizing that this is where my people had lost their control over this island and their land and their own future really struck me. I mean, it was just, this is the place where they broke our back. Thus ended for Kodiak more than 7,000 years of gentle occupation by a people who honored the land. Russia took possession of the island. Warfare, forced labor, and new diseases decimated the population. By the mid-19th century, only 1,500 Alutic survived, of what once numbered 20,000. In 1867, Alaska was sold to the United States. Some natives protested that Russia could not sell land it did not own, but they had become outcasts in their homeland. Now they were forced to adopt the clothing, customs, and language of yet another invader. Claims to their ancestral hunting and fishing grounds would go unheard for the next century. When oil was discovered in Alaska, Congress came under pressure to settle the ownership of aboriginal lands. In 1971, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act established some 200 native corporations. Every native alive at the time became a shareholder. The corporations received title to 44 million acres and $962 million. Corporations with oil, timber, and mineral-rich lands have prospered. On Kodiak, native corporations were granted one-fifth of the wildlife refuge. But by the law of the Settlement Act, they may not use their land in any way that threatens bear habitat. Hemmed in by the wildlife refuge, Old Harbor struggles to survive. Supplies must be flown in on small planes. A pound of butter costs four dollars.
A bag of sugar, about eight. Some 30 villagers own fishing boats. Others find seasonal work as crew. Still, the year-round unemployment rate runs about 40%. Walt, do you have any milk? Walt, do you have any canned milk? Families rely on public assistance and food stamps. One in four lives below the poverty line. Old Harbor residents reap only one tangible benefit from their lands. Families like the Hawkinsons still rely heavily on foods harvested in the wild. Salmon and other fish, crab, deer, duck, berries, and local plants are staples on the menu here. Some residents consume over half their annual diet in wild foods. The village first provided electricity to all residents in the 1960s. Telephone and television arrived a decade later. Village lore has it that any new technology, even a record player, once caused deep concern among the some people. And the records get a little old and then they get stuck on one word. Lonesome, 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 lonesome. So you have to, you know, push the needle. Well, one time this guy came and he said, his mom, when he was still in his mother's belly, she got scared. And she got scared of a phonograph. And she went to a doctor and asked the doctor if it would affect him. And uh, the doctor said it wouldn't affect him, affect him, affect him. <laughs> No family gathering is complete without the ritual of the banya. A cross between the ancient Alutic custom and the Russian steam bath, the banya brings family and friends together to bask in the heat. Oh boy, what a feeling, huh? They call it Alutic Church there, huh? Gary? Here, the Hawkinson men treat sore muscles, discuss village news, and escape the opposite sex for an hour or two. In their turn, women enjoy the same pleasures. Each year on the 4th of July, the village of Old Harbor celebrates the opening of the fishing season. It is a ceremony that combines Russian iconography, American patriotism, and the hardy spirit of fishermen. The blessings of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ be with you, Melissa Ray. Villagers crowd the fishing boats for the blessing of the fleet. Father Sergius Gherkin dispenses the holy water. The blessings of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ be with the Cape Barnabas. In his remote parish, Father Sergius has little to spare on the trappings of ritual, so he improvises as best he can. The blessings of our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ be with you. All hearts share the Father's prayers. May the seas be calm and generous. May the price of salmon be fair. May the village make it through another year. The salmon season is strictly regulated by Alaska's Department of Fish and Game. A fisherman's intuition tells him that fish are here, massing offshore in the ocean waters. But he and his crew must wait for the official opening time before they can set a single net. Upstream, bears must obey a higher power and wait for nature to provide.
In the warmth of summer, a trio of young bears cool off by practicing their fishing techniques. Others save their energy. For as long as bears and humans have inhabited Kodiak, a great cycle of life and death has unfurled in its waters. While life prospers or perishes according to its pulse, men and women time their lives to its rhythm. Every summer, Pacific salmon cross thousands of miles of open sea. They return to Kodiak by the millions to spawn in the streams of their birth. Kodiak fishermen are first in the long chain that will live off this bounty. In a record year, their catch numbered over 30 million salmon. Those that elude the nets head inland. Some experts think salmon navigate through smell. Others have different theories. Such questions trouble the bears not at all. At the height of the season, bears flock to the water. Along a single mile of salmon stream, up to 40 bears share the pickings with an assortment of other wildlife. An adult bear may catch up to 30 fish a day and put on two to three pounds of fat. Choice fishing holes are jealously guarded. one to two hundred pounds by summer's end, a bear must be willing to take some chances. Two females vie for a fishing perch. The result is unpredictable. The larger bear stands her ground. Her smaller challenger seems overpowered and leaves. Perhaps a case of nerves unsettled the challenger's stomach. Having relieved herself, she will try again. between brawn and bluff, the more persistent bear eventually wins. Fishing is an acquired skill, and each bear has its own techniques. Brute force can be effective, but a good fisherman knows that being in the right place at the right time is essential.
The fox may have a few tricks to teach him, but the bear has had very little real competition for salmon until recently. By float plane or boat, thousands of fishermen invade the bear's feeding grounds each year. They come prepared. The bears, uh, they're a problem coming into camp. The uh, bears, little bears, the cubs, they, uh, they haven't figured out how to fish yet, so they seem to want to come in and rob your kitchen. It's easier pickings. We try not to keep any fish, though, until uh, the last day, because fish is one of the biggest attractions for the bear to come in. Safety rules in the wildlife refuge are simple but critical. Do not challenge a bear if it decides to take the catch of the day. Avoid encounters at close range. Always stay in clear view. Maintain a clean camp. Most visitors respect the rules, but these campers discovered that some bears have already learned a dangerous connection. Where there are people, there must be a picnic. Come in here. Blast the gun. Yeah, Which shoot the gun. Yeah, shoot it in the air over there. This way, away from camp. <coughs> oh, he didn't move very fast. <laughs> 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 Don't get the you guys. Oh, that's the orange juice. Unperturbed, this bear ate its fill, then left. But sometimes people panic. In this century, Kodiak's records contain not a single report of a bear killing a human. Yet every year, fish and game wildlife biologist Roger Smith counts an average of 10 bears shot down by frightened people. He suspects an equal number of killings go unreported and fears a rising trend as more visitors invade the backcountry. Some people have a, quite a bit of fear of bears, and so when they see or hear a bear, they, uh, uh, their automatic reaction is, uh, is one of fear, and you know we've got to, we've got to do something to react to get this bear out of camp. And it, it appears that, that this one was shot to, with a shotgun, uh, but probably fairly close range. The bear was apparently one that a number of other uh, sport fishermen in the area had chased off uh, uh, previously that same day and uh, hadn't really considered the bear a threat. The life of a bear is full of natural hazards, attacks from its own kind, food shortages, accidents, but nothing is more deadly than the presence of humans. Where their world begins, his world ends. Like Old Harbor, the native village of Larson Bay is surrounded by the wildlife refuge. Residents have yet to build a fence that can keep bears out of the garbage dump. Villagers have grown accustomed to the animals. Bear watching is a local pastime. But resident Roy Jones learned that a bear habituated to the presence of humans can be frightfully bold. I came up here to dump the garbage in the truck and uh, there was uh, several bears walking around me there and I, so I decided to uh, just film them instead and then I dumped the garbage later. Well, this one bear decided that he'd uh, give me a hand, so he'd just come over to the truck and, and uh, start checking it out there. And he, he'd, uh, he was eyeing me and being real cautious. He was just as cautious as I was being, and then he... Uh, hey, be careful of the paint job. ...proceeded to get into the truck and take the boxes out. Getting a little bit close. 
your blood pressure feels like it's going up, your adrenaline's going, and and uh, it's uh, it's a it's a good it's a different kind of experience. Bears are protected by state game laws even when they take over village streets. Without a costly hunting permit, a bear can't be shot for sport. People may not provoke the animals or bait them with food. But if a bear poses a serious threat to life or property, it may be killed. Okay, the bear hit the corner of the house here and banged against it and kept going along the wall until he got up by the window. And then he uh, stopped by when he got by the window because I spotted the flashlight on his face. And he was looking in and I was looking out at him and I froze, I couldn't move, I couldn't talk, I couldn't do anything. And I did, I shot him right in the butt with the shotgun. But I thought I had number nine shot in it. But I found out later it was double alt buckshot. So he did get hit hard. Monarch of Kodiak Island, the bear has reigned supreme for eons. He will survive only as long as his wilderness survives. But his home may soon be sold piecemeal. Willing to challenge the law that restricts the development of refuge lands, outside interests are ready to pay top dollar for native-owned parcels. Here they see prime recreational real estate, ripe for roads and runways, lodges and cabins. Forced to compete with people for salmon and open space, the bear's numbers would dwindle. The Aleutic people face a difficult choice. To prosper, they must either sell their land or develop it themselves. In exchange for hard currency, Kodiak natives could lose everything they cherish. To make their predicament known, they have hired a media consultant and Washington lobbyists. Dozens of journalists have filed reports on the Kodiak land rush. Oh, yeah, different interests have uh, been writing us letters and uh, like for instance I even had one letter that said that they will build a lodge and they will employ us people to uh, wash dishes and cook and make beds and stuff like that uh, trying to express that gee they're going to employ us for taking our land. I just tore them letters up and threw them away, you know, because we know <laughs> we didn't want that kind of employment. If there was any, if there was going to be any lodges, we were going to own the lodges and hire them to pack the bags and wash the dishes. All right, that's a good one. In late summer, the Hawkinsons harvest the waters and the land. They know time is running out on Kodiak. Their age-old way of life hangs in the balance. Rather than sell to outsiders, native corporations propose that the federal government buy back 80% of their refuge holdings for some $150 million. Natives would retain property around their villages and the right to fish and hunt on refuge lands. Most sale proceeds would go into investment funds and provide dividends for shareholders. After two centuries, the Aleutic people might finally get a fair deal. Washington has deliberated the natives' land offer since 1987. In the meantime, Old Harbor tries to boost its economy. Funded by a state grant, a new runway will accommodate larger planes. In town, a tourist lodge is open for business. Change is in the air.
Forty miles from Old Harbor, residents of the village of Akiok directly challenge restrictions on the use of their land in the refuge. Near a well-worn bear trail on the banks of a pristine lake, they erect a cabin. Tourists will have the wilderness experience of a lifetime here. Bears will lose access to a favorite fishing spot. The message to Washington is clear. Save this refuge now or risk losing it forever. A week before his return to Harvard, Sven Hawkinson Jr. sets out to collect memories of the last days of summer on the island. He misses the place already. After living back east in a big city like Boston, it's, it's just wonderful to get out there, you know, and be away from people, be away from it all. It'll be really sad if we do lose the land in terms of, I mean, we'll lose out in the long run, like my, my children's children won't be able to come back here to the way I have seen it and the people in the past, for the past 6,000 years have seen it. So, also looking, for example, at bears, you know, that's a big issue today too. Um, they're the ones that are going to lose out, not really us. As the days grow shorter, bears continue to fish, but with somewhat less urgency. They pick out the richest parts of the salmon, skin, brains, and roe. Some have added a six-inch layer of fat to their formidable frame. The bright colors of spawning salmon belie the fact that they are dying. They exhausted their final energies in the production of millions of fertilized eggs. Having nourished both bear and human, the salmon come full circle. In the gravel of the riverbeds, they leave their legacy. Before long, a new generation will escape to the open sea, only to return when their time has come. The future of Kodiak's wildlife refuge may lie in a bitter irony. In 1989, Kodiak's shores were fouled with oil from the Exxon Valdez spill. Funds from Exxon's $1 billion settlement may be used to purchase refuge lands owned by Kodiak natives. This could be the last chance to make the refuge whole again. Over a half century ago, human wisdom saw fit to protect the Kodiak bears. Once again, their future is uncertain. Into the depths of winter, the giants vanish. If their birthright is honored, they will return with every new spring.
We hope you have enjoyed this presentation from the National Geographic Video Library. They feel, perhaps as we do, they pay tribute to the fallen. They will risk the entire herd to protect one of their own. Do we share more with these great creatures than we realized? Follow the last free-roaming African elephants in Reflections on Elephants. On the next National Geographic special, beneath our world's surface is a vast and hidden realm. Maze-like passageways, gigantic caverns right under our feet. A different breed of explorer is lured into this world of darkness, confronting unknown dangers on a quest for subterranean adventure. Mysteries Underground, a new National Geographic special.